Welcome, everyone. We are so excited to have Matt Beckerman back again, our resident genius, as I like to say. And evidence, he has said, is his favorite subject. So um, that's always a good thing. And uh, maybe he hasn't said that, but it's one of his favorite subjects. And, and that's a good thing, because when you're passionate about something, you tend to be um, better able to teach it. And, and Matt knows this information very well. I'm going to do my best maybe to add some some humor and levity to the situation. But my experience with evidence on the MBE is it's a subject you can absolutely improve upon. Once it clicks, it clicks. Evidence just doesn't come in. It has to really meet certain requirements and parameters. It has to be relevant. It has to be reliable. It can't be hearsay. Uh, a lot of things that are considered before we're just going to allow something to be evidence. And once I had that shift of mindset where instead of thinking, why should we not let things into evidence? We should really focus on what's so special about this, that it should be admitted. It's so special because it is relevant, because it is reliable, because it's not hearsay. It's not, uh, any other reason that it should be excluded. And thus, it arrives into evidence. Once I started thinking about evidence like that, I got a lot stronger at evidence. Another thing for sure was hearsay. You have to know what's not hearsay, what's a hearsay exemption, and then what's a hearsay exception where unavailability is immaterial, and what's a hearsay exception where unavailability is required. For me, it took me a minute to understand that hearsay was so complex. You have to understand what's not hearsay. Maybe it's like effect on listener or something. You have to understand what is an exemption to hearsay, like a party opponent mission. And then again, exceptions are further categorized into when unavailability is immaterial, it doesn't matter, or when unavailability is necessary, like a statement against interest. So that's just one, I think, hallway, let's say, or lens of evidence, which is hard until it's not. Once you understand all the hearsay exceptions and you can recognize them, let's say like the excited utterance usually has an exclamation point. You know, there's little indicators for all of them that you recognize through practice. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go over the completed evidence questionnaire that uh, Matt and I did for July. Um, I'll kind of scroll through it, Matt, you want to kind of take over and, you know, just be mindful of the time we have about an hour to get through. Let's see. Um, 70. So, you know, about a minute each. Um, why don't you begin with the, the first? Okay. So what is the test for whether evidence is relevant? And I think this is very important because it's probably the most common question. It's 401 and it's, it's any tendency to make any fact of consequence of the action more or less probable. And this is really just such an easy standard to meet. So if you're doing an essay question, basically anything is going to be irrelevant only if it's so completely random that it couldn't possibly have any context in the case, would it not be relevant? So it's very easy. And then who decides whether evidence is relevant? That is the judge. The judge admits things and the jury weighs its credibility. What are counterweights to relevance? So that is rule 403. And that means that if there's unfair prejudice, confusion, misleading, not misleading, misleading the jury. If it misleads or confuses or is prejudicial to such a degree that it substantially outweighs the relevance or the probative value, then you can't admit something, even if it is relevant. So the thing about relevance is that almost everything is relevant, but then maybe it's hearsay, maybe it's prejudicial, maybe it's um, like insurance, which is not always allowed, maybe it's privileged. So relevance really doesn't keep something out. It's like a bare minimum that it has to that has to be met. Yeah, very important parts of the way beginning. 
it's got to be relevant, right? So any tendency, and that's a, a answer to an MBE question. What's the standard for relevancy? Any tendency to make any you know, controverted fact or fact of consequence more or less likely or probable. And then the 403 balancing test, that the probative value is not substantially outweighed by the prejudicial value. It can be hard to spot this, but something very prejudicial would be if one party was so biased that what they said would prejudice the jury more than it would give them insight into evaluating the case. Um, we said the judge decides issues of relevancy and then the jury weighs them. And then this, go ahead. I haven't seen a bench trial, the judge does both. Well, like juries only, yeah. Like in a bench trial, the judge does everything. So that's easier. Exactly. Um, and he talked about some of these issues where they um, would be considered if something would be prejudicial, if it's unfair prejudice, if it's confusing, misleading, or unnecessarily cumulative. Um, really great start. And then this tested all the time, Matt. Can you help us understand these policy exclusions? Yeah, so these are policy exclusions. So th these are things that are relevant. And in fact, they're usually there because they're so relevant that that they almost always come up, but there's policy reasons that society might want to keep them out. So for example, offers for medical care. If a person is hit by a car, the driver might say, oh my God, let me take you to a hospital, I'll pay for everything. The reason we might not want to have that in is like, if you think about it, then anyone who ever offers someone medical care could be you know, at risk of being sued for, did you cause that person harm? So you want to exclude those statements. And that's the same with evidence of insurance. You don't want um, a jury to find someone more likely to be at fault for an accident because they have insurance versus the other party. They're like, oh, don't worry, they have insurance, they can pay for it. That's not really, like, that's probably true, but that's not what we want courts to do. And then offers to compromise and plea bargaining are pretty similar. Offers to compromise is, of course, civil and settlements. Plea bargaining is always criminal. You want the parties in the criminal, the government and the defendant in the settlements, just plaintiffs and defendants to be able to negotiate on their own without the pressure of them. You know, if they admit something in a settlement in a way to get a conclusion, you don't want if the settlement falls apart for them that to be used in the trial against them. You want them to speak freely in the settlement and in the plea bargaining. And then in the subsequent remedial measures, that's also along the same lines. If someone falls down the stairs because it's creaky, and then the owner fixes it, you don't want to bring that in because then anytime someone fixes something, they might be at risk of getting sued. So you want people to offer other people medical care, medical care to have insurance, to compromise with other people, to you know get involved in plea bargaining with the government and to fix their home and their you know yard and everything without being sued. So that's why you have these policy exclusions. Yeah, excellent work. I mean, we see these all the time. The the fence, they paint the fence. We can't bring in evidence that they paint the fence to show that they were guilty for the injury of the boy getting hurt on the fence. But we can bring it in to show ownership of the fence. Refixing the fence, probably the fence would really. Any. Yeah. The and then the rape shield is also a policy exclusion. It's where you can't. So normally, um. You can't bring in uh, like the propensity character evidence of a defendant. You can't say, oh, you know, he's robbed before, he, so he's guilty now. But for rape, if someone has raped before or they've committed child mol molestation, you can bring that in against them. And I think the policy reasons behind that is just psychologically or statistically, that's a crime that is more recurring than other crimes. So if they did it once, they're more likely to do it again. And also to shield victims, you can't um, say, oh, that victim wasn't, you know, sexually assaulted because she's had, you know, so-and-so partners. So it's really like for the benefit of, um, you know, we're a society that doesn't want, I guess that wants to protect rape victims and not people who are accused of rape. So this kind of, uh, you know, shows that. Right. You can't bring in evidence 
that Sally was promiscuous to uh in a, in a rape case. It has nothing to do with the fact that Sally may have gotten raped, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, let's talk about hearsay. Maybe a better subject for the for the tone of the class. Right. Yeah. Lighter subject. So hearsay is rule 801 and the whole 800 series is hearsay super important because that's about like a third of evidence. So that's gonna be at least like eight questions. So hearsay is an out of court statement proffered into evidence in order to prove the truth of the matter asserted. And if you ever like read or watch the news, you might have you might hear people say, Oh, that's hearsay. They're almost always wrong. So don't listen to them. So hearsay is um yeah, it's just an out of court statement. So if if you're not under oath, then it's probably hearsay. But there are dozens of hearsay exceptions. So for things that are hearsay, but society and by society I mean Congress has decided that you know it might be something that we want to bring into trial anyway. So if, for example, going back to excited utterance, probably everyone's favorite because it's the easiest. If someone is shouting because they just saw a murder. It's unlike, you know, their blood is rushing, they're excited, they don't really, you know, their mind is, you know, going a mile a minute. It's hard for them to lie. The purpose of hearsay is we don't want to bring in statements that they could have thought about ahead of time and lied and then not been cross-examined about, not been checked on by the judge or the attorneys. So we don't want to just ha have these statements in that aren't, you know, balanced against. So things like excited utterance, um, you know, mental impressions, statements for medical um examination these are all statements that society has decided you know the chances of these being lies is so low that we're willing to bring them in even though it's hearsay and that also goes to question seven we don't want to bring in statements that are unreliable and untested we want them on the stand and then what do, and if anyone has any questions feel free uh what does it mean for evidence to prove the truth of the matter asserted so that means when you're introducing a statement, that's a statement that you're introducing to mean what it says. So for example, if you're saying um, Robert, you know, you go on the stand and you say, Robert told me that um, John committed the murder. You're introducing that to show that John committed the murder. That would be hearsay. But if let's say John had been dead for 20 years and the murder was committed a year ago, you might be introducing that statement to show that Robert is not in control of his mental faculties. So then that, that would not be hearsay. Or if it's a defamation case brought by John, you're showing it to prove that it's false. So that would not be hearsay either. So things that are not hearsay, when you're just introducing them to show, you know, the impression that it might make, but not for the truth of the statement, or to show that it's false, or to show notice. So for example, um, you know, you might get a letter in the mail from your landlord saying you're behind on rent. You can introduce that not necessarily for proof that you were behind on rent, but that your landlord thinks you are. So th there are just things like that that you have to be careful of because it's it's easy to forget. Yeah, and there's a question that I recall. It's about like a stolen television. And the <clears throat> answer is that the statement that the television was a gift from someone else is admissible because it's not being brought in to show that they stole the television, but that they had knowledge that it was a gift. And so that was one of those cheeky examples of when it's not being brought in for the truth of the matter asserted. Like, what is it saying? He killed Tommy. That's the statement. We're not bringing it in to show that he killed Tommy. We're bringing that statement in to show that uh, he he could speak, you know, words came out of his mouth, like just something other than the truth of the matter asserted. Is that decent matter? Do you have any other yeah. ways you can explain that? Yeah, I mean, if the case was based on like this person being mute and not, not having spoken for 20 years, you can introduce anything they say and that wouldn't be hearsay because they're introducing it for the fact that they are able to speak. So there are lots of reasons you can introduce statements not for their own truth. And this is important because if you're not introducing it for its own truth, it's very easy to bring in. You don't have to meet a hearsay exception. So um, I'm traveling with my friend and he, you have put him to sleep <laughs> because, uh, you know, not, not that you're boring, but just evidence hearsay. He's not taking the bar exam. So it uh, just goes to show everyone out there that this is tough stuff. And, and 
Um, we appreciate you all for digging deep. So we started off with what is not hearsay. Maybe it's to show the effect on the listener. Maybe it's to give notice that the TV was uh, a gift or something. Um, and what would we talk about a statement, Matt? What does that mean, a statement under the FRE? Can I interrupt yeah. briefly and ask for a clarification on seven? Where the answer was unreliability, untested. We want them on the stand. Is that to say that you'd rather have somebody say something in court and not what was brought in from outside trying to dispute it. Is that how I'm understanding that? Yes. When okay. you're in something in court, you're under penalty of perjury because you take an oath. And the oath is supposed to like impress this kind of civic duty into you to tell the truth. You can also be criminally charged. And you have the other attorney, you know, going after you for everything you say. Whereas if it's hearsay, you have none of that. Thank you. Yeah, and then I think we did this when Sinead O'Connor was still alive, but I think it still still works. So a statement can really be anything that communicates or asserts. So pointing can be a statement. Um, yeah, like nodding is a statement. Shaking your head is a statement. Shrugging is a statement. But they do like to trip you. Animals can't make statements, even parrots, I think. Actually, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's law. So maybe we'll skip parrots. Whoa. But animals cannot make I, I love parrots. I was actually, well, I live in Coconut Grove. I'm walking down the street the other day, and this lady had a parrot on her shoulder. But a good example is a dog who smells drugs in your pocket. That's not hearsay because the dog barking is not hearsay. Or the machine that's the um, speedometer. I think that's what it is. Right. Right. Yeah. The speedometer when you're driving that says 102 miles an hour. It's not a statement. It's machine or animal. Yeah. Period. All right. Parrot. Yeah, parrot's a good one. I mean, Matt, you always like to think of the craziest examples. I mean, the parrot who's speaking English, like kind of tough, but <clears throat> let's just focus on typical animal noises. All right. What about number 10? Here's a map back. <laughs> so I kind of already answered this because there are lots of things that we might want to bring in. So for example, there's a hearsay exception for ancient documents which I don't know if I really agree with that because it's anything from before 1998. But that's just that's just going to show that like if something was made that long ago and it's being brought into litigation now, then it's probably going to be truthful because then you would have had to plan 30 years ago. Whereas you don't necessarily just want to bring in any document that was made five years ago because that could have been, you know, you don't want to trust that as much. Is your birth certificate an ancient document? Um, I think that's, I think birth certificates can come in on their own. I just like a public record. I was just asking okay. your age in a whatever. But all right, next question. Yeah. Let's let's look at a uh, number twelve. Um, uh, no, number eleven. When can hearsay within hearsay, multiple hearsay, be admitted and find where in the effort this is found? Good question because I would say one of the very hardest concepts to grasp is this hearsay within hearsay, um, double hearsay or multiple hearsay. Matt, you think you can try to simplify this for us? Yeah, so there are lots of statements that might be hearsay multiple times. So, for example, if you if you introduce a document and it says Robert says that Bob says that John said, you know, your the document has to be um, shown. Like it could be a business record. I don't know why that would be a business record. It could be a public record. And then you have to show that what Robert said meets a hearsay exception, then you have to show what John said meets a hearsay exception. So for example, like if, so you have present sense impression, um, let's say you see a car going by and you say, look, a car is going by. And then next to your friend is excitedly saying, look, he's saying a car is going by. Cause I don't know why he'd be excited, but one of them would be an excited utterance. The other would meet present sense impression. And in order to introduce that statement, you need to meet both. I think that example could use some work, but we can move on to 12. Um, a major yeah. exemption. No, I just think that's fair. Hearsay within hearsay. He said, she said. There's a, a great question where the gender said that, and then he says a statement that would be a hearsay exception, but it's because there's another level. He said, she said, or there's one about the staircase. Like, you know, he, he said this, and it would come in if it, the statement would come in on its own, but it's not the statement that's, we're looking at it's someone else 
recanting that statement. And that's going to be the multiple layer of, of hearsay. So good work. And, and you'll work on that with, uh, with questions. So what about number 12? <clears throat> a major, yeah, so go ahead. A bit. So for past inconsistent statements, you can always use it to impeach, but you can only use it for truth if it's made under oath. So I would like move the made under oath to the second line. Because I think if, even if it's not made under oath, you can still use it to impeach, but it doesn't have to be made under oath to impeach is what I'm saying. Okay, you want us to correct um, some of the language here. Let's, uh, yeah. why don't we just rewrite it? What should we write for past inconsistent statements? Yeah, you can use it to impeach because obviously if you're saying something on, on the stand and you said something completely different in the past, you know, it'd be worth bringing that up. But if it's also a past inconsistent statement under made under oath, so for example, at a deposition or at a previous trial, you can also introduce that, that for its own truth because, you know, it's not hearsay. It was made at a previous trial. Mm -hmm. oh, and then past inconsistent statements... So we kind of go into this later on also, but you can never make them on its own on their own. You can't say, uh, oh, look, my witness said this. And then five weeks ago, she also said that because then that would just never end. Every party would just do that. You can only introduce past consistent statements to rehabilitate impeachment. So, for example, if you're saying, oh, the witness said she saw the murder and then the other party says three weeks ago, you know, the witness said she didn't know what was going on. You can then introduce, you know, a co contemporaneous document where maybe the witness talks to the police saying exactly what she saw. So past consistent statements can only be brought in if the door is open to them. Very solid work. <clears throat> um, when I think of a past inconsistent statement, <clears throat> it's like Tommy said the light was red. And then we have a former statement where Tommy said the light was yellow. We're not going to bring in the former statement where he said the light was yellow for its truth that the light was yellow. We're going to bring it in to impeach the subsequent statement that the light was red because it's inconsistent. It's going to come in for its uh, impeachment purposes. Now, Matt gave the carve out that that was made under oath. Well, then, like you said, it's not hearsay. Um, and then the past consistent statements. I like that. That was good for me to hear you flesh out. We really are going to bring it in to rehabilitate impeachment because what, like you said, oh, well, consistent statement from the past. Let's just keep bringing them in. It kind of be a never ending process. I appreciate that perspective because that, that was helpful for me. Um, all right. In honor of Ivis Prep's favorite athlete, Dan Marino, let's do question number 13. Okay, so yeah, you the five party opponent exemptions and this is all rule 801. So if you're like, if you're, if you have your FRE open, like that's what you should turn to. To the statement actually made by the defendant, that's the, you know, that's the most obvious one. They actually said it. And this is something you can always introduce. This is never anything an opposing party said is never going to be hearsay. Because you can, you can always introduce it. And that's because, like, they're going to be there. They're at the trial. You can ask them about it. Or their own party can ask them about it. There's also adoptive admission. So, for example, if someone says to you, oh, uh, I guess there, there's actually an example here. Yeah, nodding when someone asks, did you rob the bank? You didn't say you robbed the bank, but you nodded in response. And that's essentially adopting it. A statement made by a party's agent and a statement made by a party's employee within the scope of their employment. These are both kind of similar. You can collapse them together. And a statement made by a party's co-conspirator for all three of those, as long as you show some evidence that there is an agency relationship, that there was an employment relationship, and that there is some kind of conspiracy, you can introduce those three. Solid, yeah. Um, so- the present sense, an excited utterance you say? Is there something you wanted to say? No, I would just say that this one comes up a lot, the uh, party opponent um, admission yeah, like, all the time, right? Yeah, and then um, this co-conspirator one, it's just, it, it does come up. It's good to know that that is an exemption, but remember, Party opponent is an exemption, not an exception. See, they, they want to suggest it, but that would be incorrect. There's a difference between, like we talked about, non-hearsay, things that are just not hearsay, then some types of hearsay exemptions, right? 
and that's where we're at. Yeah. And then now we're transitioning into the world of exceptions. These two exceptions, unavailability is immaterial. They, it, they don't have to be unavailable in order to bring it in. There's certain ones that we'll see. Um, well, I guess you can explain this yeah. in more detail, but, but go ahead. Like on my slides, it might be worth like pulling them up on half the screen, 803. Because that has like all of them. That's going to be like the next 20 questions. Yeah, so this really just has all of them. Um, if you ever don't understand a rule, like it says it. So 803, oh, do you think we could also have the questions on here? Like in some magical formula? Yeah, I think I can do that. Split screen? It's like, you, you cut the windows in half. Yeah, split we screen. We also don't have, yeah. No, I can do it if someone just tells me exactly how. Yeah, you got to exit out of one tab, make it like one web page and one another, and then you click on the green button at the top left corner and it'll give you the option to tell the window to the left to the right of the screen. Yeah, so make that like half. Um, so top left, you'll see a green, like all the way top left, like where you can like close out the web page or make it yeah. bigger, maximize it. You click down on the green and they'll tell you to tell the window. All right. I, I kind of did it. I put this green button. Can control. You can take control, Matt. And no, I think I think oh. you have to give me. Um. Just give me one sec. We also don't have to do that. No, I know. I, I hear you. I just fucking. Tr I tried. I pressed this green button. And. Uh. Don't, you don't press it, you just hover over it and over the green um, part. Like in the corner, you hover over the green part. I can't, I can't figure it out. Don't worry, but thank you. Um, let's just, let's just roll without it, Matt, because I, I, I can't. Go ahead, Ben. Let's just look at the um, actual. Yeah, but everyone, I think everyone watching should have it open. Yeah. Everyone have the 803 open and we'll just go back to the questionnaire. Right. Can you see the questionnaire? Yeah. Yes. All right. So we're on question 15. So this is uh, the definition 803.1 and 803.2, which is present sense and excited utterance. So a present sense is an observation or perception at the time of the incident. And it has to relate to what you're actually, I don't want to say looking yeah, because it could be anything you're smelling or touching or hearing, but it's basically always going to be what you see or hear. And it has to actually relate. For a present sense impression, if you see a car go by, you can say, oh, a car is going by. That's your present sense. For excited utterance, it can be anything. So as long as you're in an excited state, maybe because you heard a gunshot or you just ran away from um you know a, a moving car with no one in it or you, there's an earthquake or something as long as you're in like a jittery state then you're, it can really let in anything and an excited utterance generally lasts longer than present sense present sense is as long as you're looking or hearing something an excited utterance could be 45 minutes so excited utterance longer and it can let in more things is i would say is the main difference and then the scope of the mental, emotional, or physical condition here, say, this is 8033. So this is how a person feels at the time, but it's not going to include memory. So if you can include a statement saying, you know, John said he was, um, I don't know, looking to take revenge that day, that is, you know, that's a mental condition. But you can't say John remembered that he had a, the gun in his attic because you can't say anything that relates to memory unless it's about a will or trust but they don't ever test that so i wouldn't worry about that and then 18 what are the limits if any of statements made for medical diagnosis or treatment this is 8034 it must be made for the purposes of treatment and it can be anything from you know physical symptoms or 
uh, how it occurred. And it, this is pretty broad. You can say, you know, I was shot and that's why my arm is bleeding, but you can't say Jerry shot me. So if they tested on that, they'd cut out the Jerry part, but they could put in the was shot part. So it has to be related to the treatment. Um, one thing and, is it doesn't have to be to the doctor who ends up treating. It could be any doctor that you go to and, and say the statement to. They don't have to actually end up doing the treatment. Another thing is they can go, go ahead. Or like a nurse. Or a nurse, yeah. Or a nurse, yeah. Another thing is they could bifurcate the statement, meaning that if you say to the doctor, um, he robbed me and stabbed me in the neck, right? The stab me in the neck part is for medical diagnosis, you know, the bleeding. The he robbed me part might not be admissible there because it's yeah. not for the purpose of medical diagnosis. That's that's correct, Matt? Yes. Cool. Yeah, so the elements of a business record exception has to be normally conducted in the course of duties by the person who regularly does that or adopted by someone like at the time. And it can't be in the anticipation of litigation. So, and this is called the business record exception, but it can really be for anything uh, like a book club. Um, you know, if you're like a fishing hobbyist and every day you take, like you make notes of how many fish you caught, it doesn't matter if it's not a business that can still count, but it has to be something you normally do without consideration of suing someone. And then the public record and absence of a public record exemption, there's also absence of a business record. So, for example, if someone every day makes a record of something, but on that one day they didn't, you can also introduce that. So public records, which are records made by the government, they're generally admissible when it's something that like an agency puts out or uh, records by a, like a police officer, except when they're under a legal duty to testify. But that's 8038, I think. I think the best way to get that is just to read through it. So going to 803, or excuse me, 804, when a person is unavailable. So this is pretty intuitive. They're dead. They're out of the country and you can't really find them and you put an effort into finding them, but you can't. They have some kind of immunity or privilege, which we'll go into. They refuse to testify. And then the fifth one, which we don't have, is that they don't remember. But when someone doesn't remember, they have to affirmatively go and testify that they don't remember. They can't just say they don't remember remember and not come so they have to testify to that effect and from what i understand it's like they don't remember what they are supposed to have remembered like the reason that they're being uh that they're a witness is they're supposed to say something and that's why we have them here but now the reason that we yeah. have, I mean, we have they, no, they, they don't remember, remember. but they testify to that like i see i assume they're lying a lot of the time I think also another one when you're not available is like if you're really sick, like you're in the hospital. Yeah, like dead or like you're lacking capacity, you're in a coma. Yeah. Oh, so that's like incapacity still. Yeah. Because that, okay. I guess that technically you're not able to testify either. So there's also the residual hearsay exception, which is the catch all. And I think that's 807. And that's anything can come in if, like, it's so probative on this one issue and there's nothing, there's no other probative evidence, you can maybe, you can introduce something that otherwise would not normally be admitted. And that can just be a statement that wouldn't meet any other hearsay exception, but maybe, you know, it's made by like a very trustworthy person and he has no reason to lie. You might just let it in because it's so key to this one area and there's nothing else you can bring in. So this is like very case by case. So the statement against interest exception, this is, um, again, this is one of the unavailability ones. So it has to be a statement that you make that's so against your own interest, whether it's financial or personal or legal, that you would not have made it if it wasn't true. And then there's former testimony exception. So this is former testimony from an unavailable person. And so when someone is available, you can't always um, introduce this because otherwise you can just bring them in and cross-examine them on this topic. But if someone's not available and they've already testified under oath, you know, they've been cross-examined, they figure you might, you might as well be able to bring that in. 
So you have former testimony exception, then you have prior statements by a witness, but again, like that's by an available person and that has to meet certain requirements. One of them being that that person has to physically be there as a witness, not just a hearsay declarant. So you have dying declaration, that's another unavailable one. And you might think, okay, obviously it's unavailable because they died, but you don't actually have to die. You just have to think you're dying. And then obviously there's um there's one key thing that they love to test on, and that's that you can't bring a dying declaration hearsay exception in a criminal case except homicide, which where they actually did die. So you can bring it in civil in criminal homicide or civil cases, and that's it. Awesome. And just a quick uh, aside from here, because this is super, super important. Um, let me just stop sharing this real quick. I just want to show people a really great resource that uh, I have for um, this, this hearsay um, exceptions and exemptions and kind of how we can really understand it. So... Uh, this is all in the classroom too, but you can see I'm old school. I don't even know how to split the screen. I still know how to access it the old way, but Jesse can show you the new way. But um, let's just say it's an MBE study materials, MBE subjects, and sounds like evidence, right? <laughs> Outlines, um, maybe there's a big outline. Everyone can see this outline, right? This 21 page outline is super solid. Um, and you could scroll through it and dominate life. But what I really like about it is here when it does hearsay, it talks about the, um, you know, things that are not hearsay, statements of independent legal significance, statement offered to show their effect on listener, statement offered to show speaker's knowledge, and statement offered to show state of mind. Then it shows the hearsay exemptions, admissions, which we talked about, vicarious admissions, co-conspirator admissions, prior inconsistent statement given under oath, prior consistent statement, and prior statement identification after perception. Then we have this, and this is kind of why I wanted to bring this up. And, and Matt, was he was pulling up the actual statute. We could pull that up too. And you could certainly, I, I, that's what the experts do. The students who are scoring the highest in the uh, administrations are the ones who are actually looking at the statutes and, and the code. But, you know, if you're just trying to get the minimum, I would say at least study these outlines and you can see here are the exceptions where unavailability is required, um, former testimony, statements against interest. And that was a key distinguish, key way to distinguish statements against interest from uh, admissions, right? Statements against interest, the unavailability is required. Dying declarations. And he said that's going to be in civil and homicide cases only. And they have to actually be unavailable. They don't have to actually die, but now be unavailable. Statements of personal family history and statements offered against party procuring declarants unavailability. And then these are exceptions where it doesn't matter if you're unavailable, it's immaterial. Present state of mind, excited utterances, present sense impression, physical condition for medical diagnosis or treatment, past recollection recorded. So that's if you said it at the time or it was recorded at the time, it was accurate at the time, and now you currently have no memory of it. Business records we talk about, but not records that are made in anticipation of litigation, public records or reports, um, or lack of entry in a public record could be one too. Judgments and prior convictions, um, ancient documents, like my birth certificate, documents affecting property rights, learned treatises, and family records and market reports. And then Matt did say the catch-all provision, which just means anything that's probative enough. So, you know, this outline goes into the details of a lot of these and just know there's so many different ways to, to learn these different concepts, but I just did want to take a moment to show you how uh, that can be broken down. And because I don't want everyone to think that I robbed them of a moment to see something cool, although I can't even find it. Um, can everyone see the screen? Yeah, this is rule 803, which Matt was talking about. Again, pretty much the same thing. It'll show us present sense impression, excited utterance, the existing mental, emotional, physical condition, statement made for medical diagnosis or treatment, record recollection, 
you know, business records, absence of a business record, public records, absence of a public record, certification of marriage, baptism, and similar ceremonies, records of religious organizations concerning personal family history, family records, records of documents that affect industry and property, statements and documents that affect industry and property, statements and ancient documents, market reports, similar commercial publications, statements and learned treatises, periodicals and pamphlets, reputation concerning personal family history, reputation concerning boundary general history, reputation concerning character, judgment of a previous conviction, judgment yeah, of most, most of these in the double digits are not tested, though I have seen them test 18, actually. Yeah, I was going to say, they can. <laughs> they can usually don't, like, you might get one, but, like, they usually don't test, like, after, like, 11. Sure, but the more you know, right, that's, that's kind of the thing. So I just didn't want to share that. Like, I wasn't going to rob you of everyone's moment to see the uh, statute. Um, okay, so let me try and build the questionnaire back up. Does anyone have any questions, though, for Matt about hearsay before we move on to, you know, witnesses? No? All right, that means you're doing good. I mean, I know you're doing good, but it's more confirmation. Okay, so what about witnesses? Yeah, so a witness, you have two types of witnesses, lay and expert. And I think everyone, like, they kind of know. They don't fully know, but you kind of know from, like, TV and growing up, a lay witness is a person who testifies as to what they saw, and they can only testify as to something they personally observed firsthand. So something I like to ask about is testifying to something you heard from someone else. Unless you're testifying to say they told me that, you can't testify to something you weren't firsthand aware of. Then you also have expert witnesses, but I think they're lower down in the question. So lay witnesses, that can, that's the 600s. Expert witnesses, that's the 700s. Um, you have the first thing you have to check is if a witness is competent and a witness is assumed competent unless shown otherwise. Um, if a witness is under 18, they're not necessarily incompetent. And if a witness is like a known liar or, you know, they have felonies for, you know, forgery or fraud and deception, they can still, they're still competent anyway. Well, you're only really incompetent if, you know, you're not really in control of your mental faculties or you're essentially a baby. And that's something, so the judge determines competence um, whether a privilege exists and whether evidence should be admitted. So those are the three things that a judge controls at the onset. So how does a witness show that he or she will testify truthfully? So swearing under oath in a way they understand. So if it's like a five-year-old testifying, you might not give them a Bible, but you might say them say it to them in a way that they'll understand. Whereas if it's, you know, someone who doesn't speak English and they need a translator, you would also have to translate the oath for them. And if you don't do that, um, that can be appealed. So after a witness is found competent, under what circumstances can they testify as a lay witness? Look for matters that they have personal knowledge of and is relevant. So, of course, they have to be competent, but then everything they say has to be relevant. And you've seen it on TV where lawyers say objection, relevance, and that's either overruled or sustained. Everything they say has to also be admitted by the judge. And then for expert witnesses, they have to be qualified. And you can really be qualified for like through anything. Um, if you play video games for 15 years, that might make you a video game expert. You don't have to go to school, but having degrees and certifications and education that does help. And then you also have Daubert. And I think Andrew said that Florida is Daubert now. Yeah, Florida went from Daubert to Fry and back to Daubert. Yeah, so Florida is now a Daubert. I don't have to explain Fry because I guess it doesn't matter anymore. But Daubert is when you're introducing a scientific method or you have an expert, their expert testimony has to be based on some kind of reliable practices. And you have to, so for example, if it's an expert in, if it's a spaceship crash and he's an expert in rocket engineering, you have to look at peer reviews. Um, do other rocket engineers or rocket scientists like agree with him? Does he have the same methods as them? What is the error rate? Things like that. Um, that's very fact. Like, if they give you a question on it, like they have to show you, they have to basically explain everything to you. So, can a witness be both an expert and a lay witness? Yes, as long as they're an expert in whatever they're testifying about as an expert, and they have firsthand knowledge of whatever they're testifying about as a lay witness. So, refreshing a witness's collect recollection. So that is when 
a witness remember or knew something but can't remember it anymore, you're allowed to give the witness something to jog their memory. And that can be anything, even a bowl of spaghetti, apparently. So can a court call their own witnesses? Yes, they do like to test on that. They do. And the answer is they can. And how can a party exclude a witness? Wait. Oh, I think they I think they have to you exclude a witness, you have to go to the court and ask either they could they have to testify elsewhere, and that's usually in the case of child abuse, where you might want the person to testify out of like in you know in a sidebar or in the judge's chamber so the child doesn't hear it. So what what are the adverse parties options what a witness uses a writing to refresh their memory? So the adverse party can look at it. And that writing can't be introduced to the jury. I think they can read straight from it. That's what you mean to say. It can't be introduced, but they can read straight from it. Can you clarify and make sure? Because, I mean, can you tell us about this? Again? Yeah, I think this is, let's pull up. I think it's a rule to um, 13. I mean, sorry, 613. If you want to pull that up. Or I guess maybe it's 6, 11. Oh, it's 6. Um, I think it's, it's 6, 12. My apologies. So this is writing used to refresh a witness. So 6... Uh, 612B, they do like to test on, and that's otherwise provided by law. An adverse party is entitled to have the writing produced at a hearing to inspect it, to cross examine the witness about it, and to introduce the evidence into evidence any portion that relates to the witness's testimony. If the producing party claims that the writing includes unrelated matters, a court must examine the writing in camera, which means like right there in chambers, delete any unrelated portion or the rest be delivered to the adverse party. Any portion deleted over objection must be preserved for the record. So when you're giving a writing to a witness to refresh their memory, you want to give the other party a lot of options because, you know, in theory, you could have the lawyer give their witness a writing telling them exactly what to say. So you need to give the adverse party a lot of leeway in objecting or having it themselves so they can counter it. Whereas if, their law if the lawyer gives their witness a bowl of spaghetti, that's not, the need to counter that is not as high. Okay, so privileges, and I know um, Gabriella asked about that. So for the FRE, privileges are found in the 500s. But another thing about privileges is that there are a lot of privileges that are federally recognized that are not in the FRE. So that might not be the best answer, but... Generally, the federally recognized privileges are a psychotherapist patient, not doctor client, not doctor patient. Doctor patient is not recognized, but psycho psychotherapist patient is. Um, priest parishioner privilege is recognized. Attorney client, spousal, and there are two types of spousal, which we'll get to. Um, there's also executive privilege. If anyone um, wants to chime in with any others, otherwise we'll move on because they're just a bunch. I don't think accountant is recognized. That's just at some state. So there are two types of spousal privilege and this trips up a lot of Florida people because I think it's opposite of what Florida is. So you have testimonial privilege, which is you can refuse to testify against your spouse in a criminal trial. This only applies when you're still married. So if you know you were married at the time of the incident, but by the time of the trial you're not married, then you can't invoke this privilege to not testify. There's also marital communications. That's communications that were made during the marriage and were expected to be confidential. So marital communications privileges can always be used criminal or civil, and it survives divorce. So if you know you divorce your wife, but she's testifying against you in court for something else, you can make her stop testifying because it was a confidential communication made during marriage. 
Whereas for the testimonial privilege, it has to be in a criminal case, you have to still be married and only the person testifying can invoke it. So you can't stop your spouse from testifying against you unless it's about a marital communication. If there's anything you want to add to that, Andrew, because I know people can kind of jumble them together. Well, just to clarify, because you're talking about my Florida people, in Florida, we do not recognize the testimonial privilege. We only recognize the marital communications, which I so eloquently referred to as pillow talk. That survives even marriage. That's recognized in Florida and in federal. But in federal law, we do recognize both the testimonial privilege and the communications privilege. Now, an important thing that they love to test is Tommy and Sally are married, right? Tommy wants to use the privilege to prevent Sally from testifying. Sally hates Tommy. Can't wait to testify against Tommy. It's Sally's privilege to invoke, not Tommy's to invoke upon Sally. Sally can decide very well. She wants to drag him if she so chooses. But that's a, a, an important thing to test, that the testimonial privilege belongs to the testifying spouse. The marital communications one, either spouse can invoke. That's like pillow talk, things in the sanctity of marriage. Yeah, no, I agree. So who holds the attorney-client privilege? Again, that's only the client, not the attorney. They might have a question where the attorney tells the client something and then wants to stop the client from testifying about it in court. They can't do that. It's only the client. For obvious reasons, because, you know, it's a client who's giving the attorney personal sensitive information, not the other way around. One thing. So what sorry, one thing I'll note about this that they love to test is two people who are, let's say, business partners consult an attorney and they have communications, you know, that's protected. Then later, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. The business doesn't work out. Now those two people are in litigation against each other. Well, that those communications that occurred with the attorney are not protected. I know I said not so weird, but they're not protected because they were made in front of each other. They were in privy with each other. So that would not be protected. Another time it's not protected is when it's in furtherance of a crime. That's right, Matt? Right. Yeah. It's in furtherance of the crime or i think if it's about the fee, like payment then it's not protected either and they do they might test on that like if there's an issue between the attorney and the client refusing yeah. to pay the attorney then the attorney can introduce that great point because some people don't recognize that some things that seem like protected communications are not communications like how much you paid or they saw you walking out of the office right like these are just things observations observations and protected communications are different they can observe you walking out of someone's office or they can observe the price you paid for services that's not the actual communications which is what is protected right so in addition to communications you have work product which is anything that an attorney or their paralegal or their contractor or someone who works for them makes in the anticipation of litigation and um, yeah, this is protected except in CIPRO where you have, you know, the exception to that, but in evidence, you know, it's basically protected in terms of for evidence questions. So where is doctor patient privilege accepted? Is it recognized in Florida? Yes, sir. Okay, so it's only at some in some states, but not at the federal level, whereas psychotherapist patient privilege is accepted at the federal level. And this can get tricky because Obviously, a doctor can act as a psychotherapist, but it's only the only th things that are protected are things that you tell them about your, you know, how you feel and your mental state and your emotions and things like that. Not, uh, you know, my stomach hurt today or, you know, I want to shoot that person with a gun. Actually, that's protected if you say it to a therapist. That's not protected if you say it to a doctor. So you have to be very careful with that. So I don't think the federal government has accountant client privilege. It does have priest parishioner and it does have like executive privilege and legislative I, privilege. I know Florida does have this. So that's why I was not shocked, not shocked, but 
I was a little bit surprised that it's not explicit, but I trust you. Absolutely. Anyone have any questions about privileges? I know, Gabby, that was your thing. Any yes. Questions? <laughs> Did he do a good job of 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 um satisfying your questions? Yes, it, he explained it really clearly. Thank you so much, Matt. He's the clear one. Andrew, we talked the other day af and after everybody left class, you said to mention about grand jury and the privilege. Oh yeah, that's an important part that that's a common answer to question is that the rules of evidence do not apply at grand jury proceedings. We might right. I think that's a questionnaire. We I was gonna say I think we get to that, but yeah, foreshadow. The rules of evidence do not apply at grand jury proceedings. I think the privileges do though. Like attorney client privilege, that still applies at a grand jury proceeding, but not like oh. hearsay and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's talk about character, evidence, and impeachment. It sounds okay. Funny. So character is evidence of a person's character. I couldn't say it better myself, but you can't, the point of character evidence, at least the rule is that you can't use evidence of a person's character to show that they committed a crime because it's not a crime to be a bad person. And I don't want to say it's not a crime to have committed crimes in the past because that, that is a crime, but you can't introduce evidence of a person's past crimes to show that they're more likely to commit a crime now. And obviously you can get into mimic, which we will, but you can't sh use a person's past robberies to show they have a propensity to commit robbery, but with the exception of rape and child molestation, which we mentioned before, you can use those to show propensity, but only those. And then in what types of civil cases is character evidence allowed? And that's when character is at issue. So defamation, obviously, if, you know, if someone's character as an adulterer is at issue, you can introduce testimony about a person's character or for child custody, but that's kind of unique just because I feel like that's a little different. And then you have fraud, which also like, you know, truthfulness in a person's character is that issue as well. One good example I could use for this is defamation. I called Tommy a thief. Now I could bring in evidence of him having stolen in the past, you know, specific instances of him stealing. Why? Because truth is a defense to defamation. So I'm not bringing it in, you know, to convict him of uh, larceny or, or thievery. I'm bringing it in as part of the issue, the character issue that is a uh, part of defamation. So I'm bringing in evidence of him committing thievery because he's accusing me of defamation. And if he actually did these things, then he is a thief and then truth is a defense. So that's one example of character being at issue. Yeah, so when can a criminal defendant introduce character evidence on his own or her own behalf? And this is this is important because civil defendants cannot do this. But if the other party introduces evidence of a person's bad character, for example, if you know you're, you're on you know you're on trial for battery and they're introducing evidence that you're violent, you can then introduce evidence that you're actually peaceful. And this goes back to with um, prior statements by a witness. You can only introduce prior consistent statements after the door has been opened to impeach you. So similarly here, you know, you can't just be allowed to introduce evidence of your peacefulness if you're on trial, because then you'll just do it for hours. But once they introduce evidence that you're violent, you can introduce counter evidence. And then 47, we talked about past evidence of rape and molestation is admissible. And that's an exception to all of this. So what is impeachment? It's discrediting the witness. And what are the different reasons for which a witness can be impeached? And there's, on, there's honestly so many reasons. This is just a few of them. Bias, lack of expertise, ulterior motive. Maybe like they can't remember. They're lying. Um, yeah, I'm sure, we could, I'm sure we could think of others. For example, yeah, bias. I think bias probably covers most of them. Like they don't like the attorney. They don't like the judge. So for what purposes can prior bad acts be used against a well, party? Matt, I just, I put lack of sensory capabilities, meaning like we can bring in evidence that you weren't wearing your glasses and you said you right. saw the crime. Yeah. Yeah. So for what purposes can prior bad acts be used against a party? 
So this is important because they like to test on this, but it's not character evidence. So there are five of these, motive, identity, mistake, or lack of mistake, intent, and common scheme. So for these, you're not showing that a person has a propensity to commit a crime, but that if a person is on the stand saying, I didn't rob that safe, I wouldn't even know how to open a safe, but they have prior conviction, convictions for cat burglary, you can then introduce that to show, you know, motive or identity or lack of mistake, like they knew what they were doing because they've done it before. Or if someone, you know, was seen on video shooting someone with a red gun, they might say, I don't, I don't even like the color red. Then you might show like they own five other red guns. Those are kind of easy questions because they kind of have to be easy for common scheme or plan. Like when a murderer like leaves a card at the victim's house or whatever, and they always leave cards. But yeah, people always forget mimic, but is it is a popular thing to test on. So great examples, man. You you just went through all the ones I was gonna give the red barreled gun for identity, the way they bury the body for common scheme or plan. Here's one. Uh Tommy and Johnny, you know, get into a quarrel and Johnny kills Tommy accidentally. But now we're bringing evidence from the day before of them having an argument. Why? To show a motive. Maybe it wasn't accidental. Right. Maybe, yeah, they had a motive. Yeah, or like the Unabomber. I think he like he always left like manifestos wherever he bombed. Like that would be a common scheme. Right. Or the Joker in his little card. Yeah, exactly. So what is habit routine? I think routine is when it's a I could be incorrect. I think routine is for organizations or corporations, and then habit is for people, but it doesn't really matter. So this has to be more than a few isolated incidents. It has to be continuous and systematic. So if you, know, you have a habit of sometimes forgetting to put on your blinker when you turn, that's not enough. But if you consistently, you know, as soon as you wake up, you go outside to smoke a cigarette, that's your morning routine. Every day you do that. That would be a habit. It has to be consistent and continuous and systematic. Otherwise, it's not admissible. It has to be so systematic that like it's something you don't even think about. And the point of that is if you're doing it continuously, consistently, you're not even thinking about it anymore, you're less likely to prevaricate or lie about it. So when can criminal convictions be used to attack a witness's character for truthfulness? Well, if truth is an element of the crime, such as fraud or deceit or forgery or things like that, perjury. So what special protections exist when the witness is a criminal defendant? Why might these protections exist? A confrontation clause, right against self-incrimination, immunities. And again, because, you know, we like to think that people are innocent. And if they are, we want to give them some protections against false prosecutions. Also, because the Constitution says so. Because confrontation clauses, you know, Sixth Amendment, right against self-incrimination, Fifth Amendment, immunities are not in the Constitution, but, you know, we like, we want husband and wife, people who are married, uh, to trust each other and to be able to speak openly with each other. And, you know, they want you to speak openly with your priest or rabbi or whatever. They want you to speak openly with your, with your therapist. They don't want you to fear the things that you say that might come back and bite you. What changes when it has been more than 10 years since a witness's conviction? So we get it. Um, do I want to go back to this later? Because I know we're running out of time and like this is a pretty rarely tested subject. I'll mention it. I've seen it tested. I mean, just because it's testable that when there is a conviction over 10 years, there's a presumption that it's going to be inadmissible. Why? Because it's so old but it's not automatically inadmissible. It's right. only inadmissible unless, and this is the inverse of the 403 balancing test, the probative value substantially outweighs the prejudicial value. Usually it's the probative value is not outweighed by the prejudicial value. Here they're forcing you to, to flip the test and, and do the inverse of it in terms of we'll only let it in if we can prove how probative it is. But there's a presumption that Convictions over 10 years are not admissible, but look for the answer. It's not automatically inadmissible. It's inadmissible unless the probative value substantially outweighs the prejudicial value. So, right. All right. Let's keep and then, can, 
religious beliefs ever be used to impeach them? And then there's so you can't just impeach someone because of their religion. But if like a core tenant of their religion is, let's say, pacifism, I know this was, I'm just saying this because it was a question on the adaptive bar that it was a person who was accused of, I think, sabotaging a tank and they're a member of a religion or no, they're testifying about someone who sabotaged a tank and they're a member of a pacifist religion that has taken, you know, very concrete steps to, you know, sabotage military equipment. They would be biased in protecting that person. So you can bring that in. So where is the right to confront witnesses found? I kind of spoiled it before, but it's a sixth amendment. And we're going, where are we going? Quickly, anyone have any questions about character evidence or impeachment? Um, one thing that I see is a lot of times we will allow something to come in for impeachment purposes, but not substantive purposes. A great example is the statement that the, you know, the light was yellow and it's inconsistent because you said it was red. We'll bring that in to impeach and to show, you know, uh, lack of credibility, but we're not going to bring it in substantively to show that it was a certain color. That's going to be a common answer. It's it's hard for something to come in for substantive purposes and impeachment purposes unless it really conforms with the 4-3 balancing test and is relevant and has all these things. It's easier to come in for impeachment purposes only, but you really have to work through the questions to see the specific fact patterns. So, um, all right, we're not we're almost done. Let's go. Matt, before we go on, um, I I have an issue with understanding the difference between reputation and character evidence. Yeah, so reputation is generally like what you hear in the neighborhood. You can introduce. I think reputation is what you can introduce when character is at issue. If I'm not mistaken, I would think that character evidence is broader than reputation because in in some states that are in federal, they'll allow character evidence through reputation or opinion. So reputation means I have heard, where opinion is I think that. But those both of them are types of I understand evidence can only be brought in when character is at issue. Right. Because it's like a it's kind of a derivation of character. All right, let's hit them with the confrontation clause. What we got? Yeah, so confrontation clause, sixth amendment. That means that when you're a criminal defendant, statements you have the right to confront witnesses, which means not only do statements not have to be hearsay, they also have to satisfy the Constitution, which is much harder. So when a statement is testimonial, it must be made by the person on the stand when you have the right to confront them. So when is a statement testimonial? The Supreme Court has had a lot of cases about this. So a statement is testimonial when it's made for the purposes of a criminal investigation. So for example, a deposition, a police report, eyewitness statement, like if someone is robbed and they're talking to the police 10 minutes later, that's a testimonial statement. But a 911 call might not be a testimonial statement because again, you know, they're so freaked out, you know, someone's in my home with a gun, that probably would not be testimonial because one, that's an ongoing emergency. And two, they're not saying it for the purposes of a criminal investigation. They're saying it because they're terrified and they want immediate help. So you have to look at the circumstances of the situation. Again, like, yeah, we have down someone crying because they saw someone get murdered. That's not testimonial because, you know, they're not crying or saying, I just saw someone get murdered because they, they're speaking to a police officer trying to think about the trial. You know, they're understandably freaked out. So you have to look at, like, what is this person's, you know, emotional and mental state at the time? What would an objective person be doing in this situation? So an ongoing emergency. So this is in the heat of the moment. And for example, if you're talking to a police officer and you're saying there are still two other people out there with a gun, you're set, you're telling them that to get these people off the street, not for the purposes of a future trial. So that would not be a testimonial statement. Right. And distinguishing when you're thinking about criminal investigation, whereas you're just saying something in the heat of the moment. Yeah. And does anyone have any questions about that? I think we're good. Let's do a authentication and best evidence rule. Yeah. So these don't come up as much, though they still do come up. So the rules for authentication and best evidence are, so best evidence is in the 1000s. Authentication is in the 900s. 
And the best evidence, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's worth reading because it's pretty standard. You only really need the original of a recording or a writing or a photograph when the authenticity of the original is at issue or someone's accused of destroying the original or hiding the original or keeping it for themselves. But other, other than that, you can always use a duplicate. And that includes like an email or a printout or a copy. Authentication is, I think, worth reading because it shows you all the ways that something might be self-authenticated. Like if it's a public record with a stamp or um, you know, self, you're testifying about it on your own or ways that you cannot authenticate something, which means laying a foundation or to be introduced, like by having someone testify that it is what it is, or that you know you recognize the person's handwriting. So definitely read through 901 and 902, because those can be tested and they're pretty important. So why would courts require these rules? Well, they, well yeah, they want evidence that's reliable, just like they want reliable testimony, they want reliable documents, they want the, the best document possible. If a photograph or a recording or a writing, like if its authenticity is at issue, then they want the original. Otherwise, then they're okay with, with a copy. And then for authentication, you can't just bring in a knife and say, this is a murder weapon. You need, you know, someone to authenticate, okay, this has his DNA on it, or I saw him hold it, or we have a receipt saying he bought this from a store. You need a foundation to be laid. Otherwise, you're just bringing in random objects and saying they're whatever you want them to be. Yeah, authentication, because you want to check the authenticity, exactly. So what are the different ways to authenticate evidence, handwriting by an expert witness or a jury comparison or a regular person? Voice, so if someone has heard him, but I think you can't, yes, you can, you can't become familiar with someone's handwriting for the purposes of trial, but you can become familiar with their voice for the purposes of trial. And that's just an arbitrary rule that is worth remembering because they do test it sometimes. Right. So repeat that because it's arbitrary. They love testing it. A lay witness can become familiar with someone's voice for the purpose of trial. They cannot become familiar with someone's handwriting for the purpose of trial. Let's think about it because handwriting is really more of a specialist. Like you got to be pretty good at yeah. hand or like a bank teller who was familiar with the handwriting before trial, but not someone who became familiar during trial. Voice, on the other hand, you know, I hear Matt's voice, you hear my voice. We, we became familiar with that and that's acceptable. All right, what about um, types of self-authenticating evidence? So if these are evidence that you don't need to lay a foundation. You don't need to have someone testify this is what it is. Like if you have the New York Times, you know it's a New York Times. You don't have to have someone say, oh yeah, that's that, that newspaper. Government documents, trade inscriptions, you don't need to lay the foundation because these things like have like they're authentic enough that we trust them to be what they say they are. So what types of evidence does the best evidence rule apply to? Yeah, recordings, photographs, um, and writings are the main three. So when are original copies of a piece of evidence not required, but when a duplicate is reliable or the original no longer exists? And this is like 95% of the time. Like they might test on it, but like in real life, like you're, you almost never need the original or something unless it's for like a contract. So miscellaneous, these are just random things that don't really fall. Um, so the concept of judicial notice, this is kind of like self-authenticating evidence in that these are widely held facts that you don't need to have someone testify to. So for example, like if, you know, someone was shot during the day at noon, you don't need to have someone testify that it was sunny out or that it was not, well, I guess you might, but you don't need to testify that it wasn't night. The judge can recognize that on their own. But the important thing that they like to test on is that in a criminal case, the jury doesn't have to accept judicial notice, but in civil cases they do. So if, you know, it's a criminal case and the judge says, this took place in Denver, the capital of Colorado. In a civil case, you have to acknowledge that's true. In a criminal case, they can reject that. Right. Civil and federal is must, yeah. must. Criminal yeah. is must, may. Some states like Florida, it's uh, must, may for both. But for this federal, it's must, must for civil. Must, must for civil and must, may for criminal. Yeah, so the rules of evidence don't apply in 
most importantly, grand jury proceedings. They like to test on that, but also appearances at court when you're being charged, um, hearings on, I think, in limine motions and sentencing hearings, as well as probation hearings. And if you're seeing a trend, these are all criminal, really, except for motions in limine, but these are all criminal things. Also military, tri military trials. It's just a common answer you see on the test. No, because the rules of evidence do not apply at grand jury proceedings. Yeah. Or they'll give you this whole big fact pattern with like lots of different layers of hearsay and lots of different witnesses and testimony, and they'll hide that it's in a grand jury proceeding. Why? Because the purpose of a grand jury is just to determine probable cause, and we want, right. we want information. Yeah, so a preliminary question that a judge might decide, and this is, I think, 104. Rule 104, and this is something we touched on before. So is evidence admissible? Is there a privilege? And is an expert qualified? So the judge decides these three things at the outset. And then, so if the evidence is admissible, the judge decides, and then they send it to the jury to decide, okay, how much weight do you have to give this evidence? Whether the privilege applies, it doesn't apply, this person can testify, and the jury decides how important the testimony is. Then is the expert qualified? And then it, they go testify and the Jury decides how much weight do we want to give this person's testimony? Do we want to take this person seriously or not? So the judge just decides like the qualifying issues, and then it goes to the jury to decide how much it ma how much these pieces of evidence matter. And all the judge's decisions on that have to be outside of the jury's presence, correct? Not necessarily. So I think Andrew and I talked about this the other day. Judges have discretion on whether to conduct these hearings outside the presence of the jury, except in very specific circumstances, I think related to criminal evidence. But in civil cases, it's up to the judge's discretion. But to be fair, 99% of the time, they're conducted outside the presence of the jury because the thought is the jury would be contaminated by hearing, let's say, hearsay or things that weren't going to be admissible, right? When we're just preliminary questions, the judge is can hear everything. So we usually don't have this in front of the jury, but Matt and I did talk about this and Matt is always right, that in civil cases, the judge does have discretion. So good question, Suzanne, and uh, good answer, Matt. All right, let's let's what, start the job. Dr. Hearing without the jury in it, if it's about the admissibility of evidence. And again, like they have the discretion most of the time, but in some cases, like relating to criminal evidence, and they have to conduct it outside the jury. And then a dispute over jury instructions, obviously, because you don't want to haggle over what to tell the jury in front of the jury. So when, if ever, may a juror testify? And you might think, why would they ever testify? But they can testify as to accusations of juror misconduct and outside influences. So there is a case in the Supreme Court in the 1980s. The jury was accused of, I think, smoking weed and drinking and doing cocaine um, during the trial. They could not, the juror cannot testify on that because that was an internal matter. The juror can only testify on outside influences. And likewise, judges can never testify as to their own trial. I saw a question where a judge heard someone, like heard the criminal defendant confess in the hallway going to the bathroom. A judge is not allowed to obviously testify on that. Instead, the judge has to recuse himself and they need a new trial. I think you lost everyone's attention when you said, what were, what were the three things they did at jury? I think they smoked weed, they did cocaine, and they drank. Yep, the classic three. All right, and what is the last one, number 70? Yes, yeah, so the difference between direct and cross-examination. Direct examination is when you're asking your own people. You ask open-ended questions. Cross-examination, you can't ask someone on cross about something that wasn't on direct. So this is a popular question. I, something you ask on cross either has to be something that was undirect or to impeach them. Amazing. Um, amazing. Look at this. We went through 70 questions exactly on time. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Matt? I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording.